Tony Blair is former British Prime Minister and the recipient of the Liberty Medal that we're going to be uh, awarding him with this evening. He released his memoir, A Journey, My Political Life, on September 1st. And since then, it has become the best-selling autobiography in, in the United Kingdom and become a best-seller here in the United States as well. Mr. Blair explained that though a memoir by its very nature is retrospective, his book is also an attempt to inform future and current thinking. In this behind-the-scenes account of his years in office and beyond, Mr. Blair describes his role in shaping our recent history, charting the ups and downs, and addressing the issues and complexities of our global world. Today we have an opportunity to listen as Mr. Blair engages in a conversation about these and many other issues with his friend and colleague, former President of the United States and Chairman of the National Constitution Center, Bill Clinton. On behalf of the Constitution Center, it is an honor to present these two international leaders who've shared the world stage during key events in each of their political lives. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Tony Blair and Bill Clinton. Now, I've promised to keep any comments and questions brief because we have so many issues to cover in the next hour, beginning with this. Based on both of your experiences in Northern Ireland and the Middle East, what are the essential elements to being an effective peacemaker? Uh, I, I, I want to tell you, I'm going to commit the truth here. I probably shouldn't do this, but... When we were on the way in here, I said, Tony, you just came out with a book. I want you to go first because I want to sell more of the books. It's very, very good, the book. <laughs> and I, he's thought all about all this in an organized fashion more recently than I have. So I'd like our guests to go first, and then I'll fill in the blanks, sort of. Yeah, I thought you were going to say when we thought about the peace process and what is the most important thing, you kind of looked at the floor for a moment and said, blind luck. <laughs> Which, <laughs> which is more or less, in a, in a, in a way, uh, what we have in, in Northern Ireland. I mean, it was... When we um, went to do the, the Good Friday Agreement, I'd actually originally thought uh, that we would be there for a day. We'd get the agreement signed. Um, actually, I had to go, in fact, to go and see the Spanish Prime Minister the next day, so I, I'd literally planned my whole diary on the basis we'd get this deal signed and everyone said, look, we've done all the preparatory work, you come in and sign it. Well, I got there and four days later, uh, I emerged. Um, and it was, in a sense, luck that we got into such a hothouse atmosphere that in the end people began to feel it was more embarrassing not to do the deal than to do it. And we, you know, if I had two sort of lessons out of uh, peacemaking, certainly so far as Northern Ireland is concerned, is the first is that you, you've got to create a basic framework of principle on which they can all agree, right? After that, there will be a prolonged period of, of negotiation and implementation, but you've got to get those basic principles agreed. And in the case of Northern Ireland, the two principles were the principle of consent. In other words, Northern Ireland remains part of the uh, UK, so long as the majority of people want it, and then in return for that, equality and justice between unionists and nationalists, between Protestants and Catholics. So there was a basic framework of principle that we got people uh, attracted to. The second thing, um, frankly, is never give up. You know, never give up, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how hard, just keep going. And we used to have this phrase, if you can't solve it, manage it, but don't not solve it and not manage it. Uh, just one final thought, actually. When I finally got to Spain, the Spanish Prime Minister, Prime Minister Aznar, had actually had my family 
because I was supposed to go out with my family. They'd then be staying with them for three days, and I hadn't been there, right? So I go in, finally get there, and go into the room, and there he's sitting down at the breakfast table with my mother-in-law. <laughs> and she says to me as we come in, oh, no, there's no need for you to be here. So I says, what have you been talking about? Oh, just Gibraltar. <laughs> so as I, as I remark in the book, I think she may have had as good an answer as anyone else. <laughs> anyway, uh, but let me just say one thing. Throughout that whole Northern Ireland process, there was someone who was sitting or standing by the phone throughout, and it was President Clinton. And I can tell you, the way he picked up on what the internal politics were of that situation, thousands of miles away. And I think there must have been some of those late night calls uh, where I wasn't making a great deal of sense, but he, he played an absolutely critical role. And I, I honestly, I think this is one of the few times I've had the chance to say this to you. Without your intervention, actually, we would never have achieved that peace in Northern Ireland. And so for me to you, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> The only thing I would uh, add to that is um, I think that both the people and the, the leaders who have to live with the consequences of any peace agreement have to at least be open to an agreement before anything that any of the rest of us can do will work. <clears throat> and then I think it's a combination of doing what Tony said, getting the principles right and then getting the things that flow from that. Once the, both sides in the Irish debate accepted the principle of consent or majority rule <coughs> and minority rights, they moved rather quickly to shared decision making and shared economic benefits and a special relationship for Northern Ireland with the Irish Republic even as it remained part of the UK. And so I think, it's, I think that's important. But I also think it really matters if there are outside forces that can have a positive impact because the people negotiating need them or trust them for, in unusual ways. So, for example, obviously the British Prime Minister and the Irish Prime Minister could have a big impact. And I could simply because of the size of the Irish diaspora and the long-standing involvement of the Irish in America with Irish politics back home. But I still think you've got to give a lot of credit for, to the people who were involved, the, the Irish themselves, all the party leaders within Northern Ireland who wanted desperately to do this, and to the public that was well ahead of the political leaders in saying, we are sick of all this fighting. Um, the other thing I think that is important for places like the UK and the United States to do if we're trying to make peace is to paint a picture of what it would look like after it was over so you make the strongest possible argument that it's in the interest of the parties to make compromises and hold their nose and do whatever has to be done to get there. And you do that by minimizing the risks and maximizing the benefits of peace. And this is something that Tony's still working on, obviously representing the quartet in the Middle East. but. But we've got to paint a picture of what this is like at the end of the road. And they have to know that someone will be there to maximize the benefits and minimize the risk. Because believe me, if they made an agreement day after tomorrow, we'd have two or three years that'd be pretty rough sailing, I think. Yeah, I think um, one thing when the president was just saying there, which is really important, is that the parties have to want it. Because I obviously reflect a lot about this now being out with the Middle East peace process. Indeed, last night I was actually in Jerusalem. Um, and here's the thing that I think is quite interesting about conflict resolution. And I know this may sound an odd thing to say, but sometimes um, they want it, but it's not very obvious that they do. <laughs> and sometimes they believe that they want it, but are absolutely certain that the other side doesn't. You know, one of the things that I do constantly now when I'm talking, as I, as I was yesterday with Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel and then um, earlier in the day with President Abbas, 
is that sometimes, in fact, many times, you will get Israelis who will say to you, look, we want peace, but we don't have a partner because the other side doesn't. Or Palestinians will say, um, you know, of course we want peace. How could we not? But the Israelis aren't serious about it. And one of the functions of the people from outside, because in the end, the peace ultimately, ultimately can only be made by those inside the process. But one of the functions of those that come in from the outside is in fact, as I say, to be persuaders of the good faith of the other. So that you're able to go in there and say, look, I'm talking to these people. I know that they want peace. And so sometimes they want it, but they aren't sure the other wants it. And what you therefore get is a crisis, not so much of a process, but a crisis of credibility or confidence in the other side's good faith. And you know, this, sometimes people say to me about the Northern Ireland and the, the Middle East peace process, what are the similarities? Well, the differences are very obvious. But one of the chief similarities is that when we first came to deal with that Northern Ireland peace process, you know, every time the unionists would say to us, well, of course we want peace, but they don't. And the Republicans would say, you don't understand. We've always wanted peace, but the other side don't. So the important thing, I think, is to try and create the framework within which the, others, the other side can explore the good faith of the people they're dealing with. Just one more thing briefly. I want to compliment you in your pre-prime ministerial years here. It also really helps if you're trying to broker a peace that is full of risk. If there is generally a bipartisan statesmanlike support for it. When John Major, your predecessor, was in office and they got that statement in December, you remember, of 92, and some things happened there, you know, before you came in office, we struggled along there and it finally got a ceasefire in 95. You could have canned that whole deal and you didn't. And I think that made a huge difference. And I think it made it harder in turn for the Tories when you became prime minister to undermine your position because you put the interests of the country and the interests of the Irish ahead of any short-term political gain you could have made. I think that that is profoundly Im important. I, just one uh, final thing on, on the, this topic. Um, I think the other thing is that sometimes there comes a moment when peace is possible because the circumstances um, that surround the conflict have changed. Now, I think in Northern Ireland, when the Republic of Ireland economy started to become, you know, this go-ahead tiger, Celtic tiger economy and so on, um, and, you know, I used to grow up as a, as a British person that used to make jokes about the Irish and all the rest of it. They were considered by the, you know, people in Northern Ireland often looked down on those in the South. And then suddenly, the South of Ireland became this extraordinary, you know, vibrant, um, dynamic economy, culture, society. That changed, the, that changed not just the atmospherics North and South, but Britain and the Republic of Ireland were both in the European Union, we started to think as two sovereign countries, look, come on, let's try and solve this thing. We've got you know, other things to think about in our relationship. And I think today in the Middle East, there is actually a similar, different but similar thing going on, which is that I actually believe today a majority of the Arab countries surrounding um, Israel and Palestine, today they, they actually know they have got a, a fundamental strategic interest in peace. And so I think there is a conjunction of circumstances there that if we're clever about it, can be an external pressure that agitates towards peace as well. I completely agree. It's, that's the one thing in the Middle East, <clears throat> along with the performance of the Fatah government in the, in the, the West Bank, that is much better than it was <clears throat> 10 years ago when we almost got an agreement. We had a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, Arab leaders giving me those private attaboys you know, but they were a little bit afraid that if they came out 
four square for the peace agreement that I offered that the Israeli government accepted under then Prime Minister Barak that their own street would revolt. Now I think they're far more worried about Iran as a real adversary and they want a strategic military, political, and economic partnership with Israel. That's the first thing. And secondly, many of these countries have been genuinely embarked on their own modernization efforts. And they realize that they're sort of hardbound, just say no, just, uh, it's just not a sustainable position. So I, I agree with that. I think that that's the most hopeful thing, really, that the Arabs desperately want this done and are really prepared finally at long last to give Israel what it has always asked for, which is not just some cold peace in the Middle East, but a genuine long-term partnership. It's terrific. Fr from a, from a regional conflict to internal political conflict, but each of you pioneered third way politics. How did that impact your, um, your time in office and what do you think of the repercussions today? I think he pioneered it. Um, uh, I followed it. Uh, I still believe in it actually. Um, I, I still think that, you know, I don't know how the debate is over here, but, but almost particularly after the economic crisis, there's a big debate in Europe at the moment, in my country in Europe. And it's really in and around the state. Okay? And what people say often is, well, look, uh, especially after the financial crisis, the state is back in fashion. And, you know, my view has always been that in late 20th century, early 21st century politics, if you provide people with a choice between a big state and a minimalist state, I'm afraid they're going to choose the minimalist state. But that's not the only choice. <laughs> and where we looked when I came into government very closely was at the reinventing government program of, of President Clinton and the idea that the purpose of the state is necessary, but it should be strategic and it should be empowering. And that then has a series of consequences. It leads you to education reform, healthcare reform. It leads you to welfare, in the famous words being a, a hand up, not a handout. It leads you to a sense of society that is about responsibility as well as opportunity. It leads you to a belief in society and community, not just in the mechanisms of the state for individual advancement. And I think that essential third way politics that was sometimes I think wrongly thought of as splitting the difference you know between left and right it was never about that for me it was about taking basic progressive values and applying them to a new world and I think the irony of it is that that is even more necessary today and it's even more necessary for a very simple reason because of the way people lead their lives you know when I say to, to my colleagues in Europe uh, or in, in uh, the UK you know, they say, well, maybe you went too far with all the reforms. I say the issue is whether I went far enough, frankly, because of the way the world's changing, right? I, I look at my uh, children and the lives they lead and the choices they make and the technology they use. You know, just, just when we, we got our, our uh, um, we, we, I got my iPad, right? Okay, so I'm a technology, I'm hopeless on technology. I think you're quite good on technology. I'm absolutely hopeless at it. But anyway, I get my iPod. I phone up my 10-year-old son, Leo, and I say, I've got this new thing. It's called an iPad. He says, yeah, of course. How many applications has it got and what are they? You know, <laughs> it's like, I think he's going to grow up in a world that is so different. And the nature of that, because of technology, because of information, is going to be... And here's where you've got to choose your words carefully. It's not more individualistic in the sense that you don't need the bonds of society and community and, and, and a sense of fellowship. But it is more individualistic in, in one way, which is that people will lead their lives expecting to make choices, expecting that their relationship with government, for example, is active and not passive, and not just sitting there and being prepared to accept whatever government gives you. And if government can't reform and change and become more enabling and more empowering and actually, you know, a partnership between government and the citizen, then people say, well, government stands in my way, so get it off my back. 
And so my view was always that that's where the right wing came in, because they said, look, what these people basically want to do is take things away from you and give it to this big thing called the state. And then the state usually wastes your money and <laughs> makes you pay too much tax and all the rest of it. So for me, that progressive third way politics that, that President Clinton really pioneered was it was a great kind of liberation um, for, for progressive politics, in my view. And I still think it's absolutely relevant today. And um, I think, frankly, there would be many more progressive parties in power in Europe today if they were if they were following it. And you probably don't, you may not remember this, but when you, just after I got elected, and you came into Downing Street, uh, and you, you, you came into the cabinet, and um, it was just one of those, you know, fabulous moments, because we were all new ministers, right? As I say in my book, I'd never actually been in power before at all. I'd never been, a, we'd been out of power for 18 years. I'd never even been a junior minister, and suddenly I was prime minister. And that was true of all the cabinet. So we were completely new to it. And then uh, in comes President Clinton, who by then had been in uh, one his, his second term and so on, and just gave us this, I think you spoke for about 10 or 15 minutes, and just gave us a perfect sort of strategic compass for what we should do as a government. Very cleverly, I may say, weaving in our campaign slogans, <laughs> to which I thought was a great, I thought, he can't really have read the, <laughs> but somehow or other he had. Um, but it was one of those, you know, it, it, it's, I still think that third way politics is, is, is the right way forward, actually. I really do. Uh, it's maybe not, you know, quite so fashionable over our way at the moment. Um, but I think, you know, my final reflection is this, that progressive people always win when they're at the cutting edge of the future. And they always lose when they become a different form of conservatism and can't handle the future. Yeah, I think if, first of all, that's about as good as I can do, what he just said. I thought it was great, but if you want to see how Tony was, uh, how he came to this, it's an incredible moving, at least to me moving, passage in the beginning of his book where he talks about his father and how his father came out of a hard scrabble, poor background and became a member of the Conservative Party in the UK because he thought once you had made it, you had to be there because the purpose of the Labor Party essentially was to build a big state to redistribute income. And what gave birth to the third way in America was the, as much as anything, the Democrats kept getting beat because people saw us as the party of big government and our own political base very often was more concerned with means than ends. We basically said, what does it mean to be a progressive or a liberal or whatever you want to call it in terms of end? You want to build the middle class, you want to reduce poverty, you want to provide essentially the tools that are necessary to build a good life, like an education. And you list all those things, then you say, we've been fighting as if the only way to do it is the way it was done in the industrial age, when the world was dominated by big top-down corporations and big top-down government. And we have to go from entitlement to empowerment. That's essentially, and if we don't, and we have to have accountability in the spending of money and responsibility for people who get opportunity that's assisted by the government. Just simple things, but it leads you to a whole different set of policy choices. And I found that I was being, even today I read that I, I'm being excoriated by people one of the uh, television commentators on one of our liberal uh, cable channels said, I was the best Republican president the country ever produced, which would come to quite a surprise from the Republicans, half of whom still think I'm a closet communist. But, <laughs> but what she meant by that was I didn't necessarily follow their, the conventional wisdom's means. I said, what do you mean? The, the welfare reform reduced rolls by 60% and then we had a, a brief recession in 2001 and people who moved from welfare to work were actually slightly less likely, not more likely, to be let go in this recession. We had 100 times as many people move out of poverty in those eight years than the previous 12 years because we had the earned income tax credit, not because we had another anti, a traditional anti-poverty program hiring people. So I just think that what 
On the other hand, you can't say from that you don't need a state. One of the things the financial crisis shows is that all systems tend to run to excess when they're going full throttle. So the most successful societies, without exception, are always those who have a strong private sector, which is by definition continuously modernizing or people go broke. And then a government, which is not by definition continuously modernizing, so somebody's got to keep prodding it to change. But it doesn't mean you can forget the lessons of the tulip boom in 17th century Holland. You've got to still have, you know, reasonable rules. And I, I think that that's, so I'm with Tony, I still think this third way thing works. If you think about the life we live now, that, let me say, he now has a project that I wanted to do and couldn't with my foundation, where he goes around and his foundation works to help governments in poor African countries, let's say, develop capacities. How are you going to have a tax system? How are you going to run your education system? How can you build a healthcare system? We build healthcare systems and economic projects, but he actually goes in and works inside out with the government. <clears throat> Why? Because he knows you need a strong government, but also, especially in these poor countries, you don't need to waste any money. You need to be effective. And it's no accident that Rwanda has quadrupled its per capita income in the last decade because they have focused on private sector growth but having effective government. And I think, I think that's, I still think we're right about that. I think people, particularly if, I think the people on the right to say that government is the enemy and we don't need it are wrong, particularly in this economic time. And I think people on the left that say the only way to deliver services or solve problems is with a bigger state are not always right and are more often wrong than right. Yeah, uh, so, so the, um, the left criticized you because you weren't left enough, and the right criticized you because you won the elections. That's really, <laughs> it's really unfamiliar, that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you see, I think the reason why, just to finish on this point, I mean, I think the reason why I think third-way politics is right is an interesting thing about politics. Is I think the funny thing is that the people are usually far ahead in analysis of the politicians. They don't say it like that and they don't analyze it like that. But actually, they were in a third way position a, a long time, in a sense, before politics was. And they were in that third way position for a very simple reason. They could see that the excesses of the past and of the capitalist system needed strong social provision. But they all also could see as the 20th century drew to a close that they were paying their taxes, that government was spending a lot of money, and they wanted it accountable, they wanted it efficient. And they also thought, look, I'm prepared to pay for people who are in need, but frankly, I expect someone who's given something also to have some responsibility for using what they're given. Okay? So, I think the interesting thing about third way politics is that I think, certainly back home in, in, in my country and in, in Europe, the constituency often in the media is quite limited because they tend to fit into very traditional left-right categories. But actually the constituency in the country is always bigger because they think just, they think like human beings, they think instinctively. And I always used to, 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 to think that However difficult it was to try and get policies through, and anybody who's ever made reform and change knows how difficult it is, you always actually had a constituency for reform and change amongst people, because most people, sensible people, recognize that you require the existence of the state there to help do the things that only the state can do. But they also expect those that are running the state to do them most effectively, most responsibly, most accountably, and with the best value for money. And actually, if we kind of keep that in our minds as progressive politicians, and start from the perspective of people, and then build our policy out from that, we're more likely to get to the answer. And I think it probably will be a third way one. 
Um, Mr. Blair, your, your book includes a um, terrific, almost nostalgic story about the last time that you were refused a table at a restaurant. Um, I think it was the day before you became opposition leader. Um, and that was my bad Italian, actually. Let me down. <laughs> would, would you all talk about what the, uh, cha the pressures of political life are like and how you deal with those, those pressures? Um, well, I have a, actually a, a, a section in my, in my book that um, rather unusually deals actually with alcohol and, <laughs> and political leaders. Um, and, um, you know, saying that I was kind of worried, because you, you do when you get to my age, that, you know, you just got to be careful with it. Um, although my description of how I had a gin and tonic before dinner and a couple of glasses of wine, there was a Glaswegian member of my cabinet who said the other day, when, when asked about my drinking, he said, look, where I come from in Glasgow, we give more than that to the canary. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, but, but um, I was also actually a real stickler for holidays and things I would take holidays. Um, and I think, you know, the pressures of political life are enormous, and particularly enormous now, frankly. You, you live in a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week media world. And the decisions are tough. I mean, I don't know. I always thought they, they rested on your shoulders, I think, easier than, than mine. But, you know, particularly with, with, I mean, not just with life and death decisions, I had to take over war and peace in Iraq and Afghanistan, Kosovo, Sierra Leone, and so on. But just the day-to-day -day business of it. It's, it's tough, and sometimes, um, you know, you're like anybody else, you, the, 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 you, you want to, to get the job done and everything, but you're a human being. And um, I always think, you know, I was very lucky, actually, having a young uh, family growing up in Downing Street, because my kids were, were teenagers, really, when I first came into Downing Street, which had its challenges. Uh, and, uh, but also had its tremendous advantage of keeping my feet on the ground, and when, you know, I shut the flat door in Downing Street at the end of the day, uh, it actually was a tremendous relief to go back into the family and talk about things that, that were incredibly important within the family, but, you know, weren't really important outside of that. But I think it's, it's a, you know, sometimes, um, particularly today, where the polit political debate can get very harsh nowadays. I mean, I see some of the things over here today in your political discourse, and oh, you really, it's pretty tough language used <laughs> and kicked around. And, you know, back in my place as well, too. And I think it's sometimes important. I mean, look, the, the society for sympathy towards politicians is probably a very limited <laughs> and small group of people. But what I tried to do in the book, actually, is say, well, this is what it's like from a human perspective being in these jobs. And believe it or not, we don't come from Mars, we're human beings. So that's what I tried to do, successfully or unsuccessfully. Um, and I try to make it very much a, a, a human account of what it's like to be an ordinary human being dealing with extraordinary things. Uh, I think you, uh, first of all, nearly everybody who gets one of these jobs, in my experience, really does, whether in America it's a Republican or Democrat, in the UK, a Tory or Labor member, they basically try to do what they think is right. Most of the politicians that I've known over the last 35 years, contrary to their current reputation and what's being said about them in the current campaign, were honest, hardworking people who were pretty smart. Once in a while you meet a dishonest person, not often. Once in a while, you meet a lazy person, not often. Once in a while, you meet a dummy, not often. And yet, they're all going to be called, in some variation, dishonest, lazy, and dumb as a post. And so what you have to do is to learn how first, you have to mentally challenge yourself to take this criticism in so that you can take it seriously but not personally. 
If you take it personally, you get your feelings hurt, you won't be able to hear it. So if it's legitimate, you won't adjust as you should. And if it's illegitimate, you won't be able to slough it off as you should. And I think a part of that is not giving up on your family life, and trying to be there for your kids, taking vacations with your family. But a part of it, for me at least, was I gave, when I became president, there were only 50 sites on the World Wide Web. And the average cell phone weighed five pounds in 1993. And so we didn't have email. So I gave 50 people that I had known mostly all my life my zip code. And I had a special one done up. Only 50 people had it. None of them were famous. None of them were wealthy. None of them, they were people I grew up with. And they would tell me if I looked like an idiot to the local gas station attendant. And these people and their kids wrote me for eight years and just kept our relationship alive. That helped. I think being with your friends helps. Uh, but I will say this, most of the mistakes I've made in my life, I, I've, you can't do this job well if you don't have a pretty ferocious work ethic. But most of the major mistakes I've made in my life, I've made when I was too tired to lift my arm above my shoulder. And a lot of people will tell you that. So the trick is I had to go back and totally reorder my whole schedule when I realized one of the reasons we weren't going to do well in the congressional elections of 1994 is I'd lost the ability to really connect with the American people and I was goggle-eyed tired all the time. But I had to use the time late at night to read because I was determined to go home and have dinner with Chelsea and Hillary every night. So I block out an hour or two a day just to have to rest or to do whatever needed to be done, changed my whole life. I know it sounds funny, but little things like that can change your whole life. And I suspect it's not true just of politics. No, for sure. I mean, the one bit of pressure I never, ever got used to, however, was Prime Minister's questions. I, love, I used to call him ragging about it all the time. I watched him on television <laughs> once a week. No, it Prime was... Prime Minister's question. You know, occasionally people in America say to me today, Oh, you must miss that Prime Minister's question time. I think, what? Uh, it is like, you know, asking someone who was investigated by the Spanish Inquisition on the rack if they'd like a stretch, you know, it's a sort of... Um, it was the most terrible, terrible time. Now, the one person who could have done it, incidentally, you could have done it. No, no I I, there was a, a time I'll tell you, in the, the book, actually, because what you really need is you need to be very fast on your feet because that is an unforgiving place. And what you don't see when you see watch Prime Minister's questions, they cut out a lot of the abuse, right, that's coming because they're only a short distance away, okay? So just a few feet away. And when you're standing at the dispatch box, there's, the other front bench are just the whole time, they're just keeping up a banter of abuse, basically. God, he looks awful today. What's wrong with him? Or someone will, and they do the, you know, the old thing, he flies down, you know, all that sort of stuff. So it, it's a, you know, so you're, you're trying to answer your questions and all the rest of it. But I remember when we were sitting, I went to see, I went to see the president in the Oval Office. And I was the leader of the opposition in, this was just before your 1996 yeah. election. Uh, against Bob Dole. And so I went to see him, and it was a big moment, right? Because you're the leader of the opposition. He's the president of the United States. So it was, you know, would you get in to see him properly? And how did it all work out and everything? And of course, the British media were all turning up, hoping for something to go wrong somewhere, you know? So anyway, I sat in those chairs that you do, uh, trying to look generally statesmanlike, sitting uh, with the president. And I remember the British media all came in. They used to kind of rush in like a great clutch. You know, the journalists would all come in and, they, and they'd shout questions. One of the British media shouted at President Clinton. They said, do you think you're sitting next to the next British Prime Minister? Now, it's a really difficult question. Because if he said no, that was kind of, that's me gone. If he said yes, he was interfering with the British election. Right? So he thought for a moment, he said, I just hope he's sitting next to the next president of the United States. <laughs> I thought, that's, <laughs> and I'm like, that's someone who could get through prime minister's questions. Yeah. Well, that actually raises uh, the next question. 
there's been a lot discussed, and it's increasing, about the special relationship between Great Britain and the United States. Uh, how would each of you describe that? Um, well, here's the, here's the thing, because there's a lot of talk now that, you know, certainly over, over our way, um, particularly in a sense uh, after my own time in office, being very close to, to, to President Bush and before that, President Clinton, um, you know, standing with America after September the 11th in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and so on. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's presented almost as if for, because let me speak from the point of view of the British Prime Minister, as if this is about, you know, you've got to keep in with America and so on. Um, and of course, you know, America, it is important for all countries to have a, a relationship with the world superpower. But actually, for me, it was always, too, about a, a, a bond of values and beliefs, a shared way of life. And actually, you know, you can be sort of um, a bit um, prissy or dismissive of that, but it, it matters and it means something. And therefore, for me, the, the alliance between Britain and the US was a matter of strategic national interest. You know, sometimes, actually, People in America are very kind. They say, thank you for what you did for America. And I say, well, actually, I did it for Britain. Um, and it's important that because the relationship still matters. Now, what is often said over my way today is, yes, of course, the American relationship's important, but power is shifting east. So go and have the relationship with China or with India or with Brazil, Indonesia, you know, the new powers that, 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 that are emerging and have emerged in some cases. And my answer to that is for a country like Britain, is in those circumstances where you do have these emerging powers, and you know, the single biggest thing I've noticed since leaving office is that the shift of power to the East is there, it is emphatic, and it will change the whole course of the 21st century. But in those circumstances, what I say is even more important to have the relationship with America, bound as it is by ties not just of national interests but of values and beliefs and convictions. And also, the same true of the European Union, because the other thing people would say to me in, in, in Britain during my time in office is, you know, yes, we're fine, we're fine with American relationship, but you know, you know what the British are like with the French, not, you know, why are you so keen on the European Union? And my answer to that was perfectly simple. In the 21st century, there aren't big and small European states. In the 21st century, France, Germany, UK, Italy, we're all small compared with those countries that are coming and emerging in the world today. If we band together in the European Union, we can be stronger individually. And so when you go to China or to India, and this is the reality, and you say, I'm the British Prime Minister, but I'm also a strong ally of the US and I'm a key player in the European Union, they're going to listen a lot more than if you say, well, I'm Britain. You know, don't you remember us? You know, we used to have an empire. Uh, it's not the way, you know, it's not the way the work, world works anymore. And it's very, very hard uh, for countries because I think this, you know, I don't think we've discussed this recently, but one of the things I think is really difficult for countries today is every country's got to decide what its place in the world is. What's its narrative about itself? You know, where does it stand in this extraordinary shifting geopolitical landscape? And for me, the, the UK-US relationship remains relevant. It's not a and an important part of our interest, it's not a, a, a tie of sentiment, it's not something that's had its day or that, you know, we talk about Churchill and Roosevelt and all those times. It, it matters. And it mattered to me when I was Prime Minister in a very modern way. Now, a lot is written about the relationship between Britain and America and Britain standing shoulder to shoulder with America. <laughs> but I remember the conflict in Kosovo when ethnic cleansing was going on on the doorstep of Europe. And the truth is, without America, and without President Clinton coming in in support of the action, we couldn't have handled that. 85% of the assets in Kosovo were your assets. And that was an extraordinary and courageous decision, actually, because I think it's fair to say 
There wasn't a great groundswell of opinion pushing you to do this in, in, in the US. Uh, quite the opposite, in fact. A lot of people in the US perfectly naturally were saying, come on, this is thousands of miles away. It's the Europeans' problem. Tell them to go and fix it. So that relationship mattered at that point in time dramatically and made a real difference to people's lives. And whatever the problems of the Balkans today, the Balkans is in a far better shape than it had been for a hundred years or more as a result of that strong transatlantic relationship. So my very, very strong, passionate view is that this is not some special relationship in inverted commas that's a matter of airy emotion or sentiment that's connected with the past. It's something that is living and breathing now with a relevance to today, with a relevance to tomorrow. And we should keep it, and we should preserve it, and we should be proud of it, and we shouldn't give it up. I 100% agree with that. You, um, one reason that, that I was so uh, elated when <clears throat> Tony won is that I thought that both the U.S. And the, United, and the United Kingdom had some formidable changes, uh, challenges facing us, and we needed to modernize our own countries if we were going to be strong enough for our relationship to matter to other people in the 21st century. I, I still believe that. I think basically, you know, I spend most of my time in places like Haiti now, and poor places where they don't have any systems. So, countries like ours that have been around a long time, a little long in the tooth, we have systems that resist change. And I, I wanted to modernize it because I thought that on the record, ever since the War of 1812, we've been pretty close. <laughs> and, uh, and it's worked out pretty well for the world. I don't think you can cite examples in the 20th, uh, in, say in the 20th century when it hasn't worked out well. People can argue about Iraq, and we'll know one of these days. But on balance, it's been a good thing for the world, because we're not imperialists anymore. And whatever we do, we do partly because we have a capacity most other countries don't. But we have to have an alliance that's uh, economic and political in order for the military to make a lick of sense. Otherwise, it's just kind of a floating isolated element out there. I think it's really important. And the thing I think is interesting is how it has transcended the personalities. You know, uh, Hillary and I felt comfortable with Cherie and Tony. I love being around their kids. I love being around their kids, whether they're around or not. Uh, it was a personal thing. And it was awkward when I became president and John Major was there because <laughs> there had been this big story that at the request of my predecessor's campaign, he had had the intelligence service rifling through the files of the British passport office to see if I had ever tried to give up my American citizenship. That was one of the things I used to read in the tabloids about myself all the time. So the British press was mortified when I became president that somehow this would destroy the special relationship. I didn't dare tell them the truth which was that I was elated for them to be rooting around in my passport files because I knew they were wasting time and money and getting me closer to election day. And I couldn't be, I could have cared less. I thought it was the most colossal waste of time and resources I ever heard, but I wasn't mad about it. But I, I realized that I had to be like, hyper careful if there seemed to be five degrees difference in my position and the UK's position before Tony became prime minister because, oh, back to the passport controversy, which wasn't true. Eventually, I had a good relationship with Major. And then we had a wonderful partnership that involved Kosovo, the, the aftermath of Bosnia, the Irish peace process, our ongoing efforts in the Middle East, lots of other things. And uh, then when, when President Bush was uh, issued, there was this made-for-TV movie that was on the other day called The Special Relationship about basically about him and me that skewered us both at the end unfairly. There were factual inaccuracies in it, one of which that I told him that I got mad at him when he said he was going to have to get along with Bush. That's factually untrue. I wanted him to get along with George Bush because it was important for our countries. And, uh, and they made a, a good relationship. You can, you're free to agree or disagree with their policies, but the fact that they held it together 
in an extremely contentious time is, is worth something. And you will see that as we go along. I, in the next five years, there'll be some other example where David Cameron and Barack Obama, who had nothing to do with all the stuff we were doing, well, they'll have to do something together that no one else can do. And as long as that's the case, and as long as at least nobody thinks we're trying to loot their countries or be imperialists, and that if we make a mistake, it's a mistake of the mind, not the heart, then people can even disagree with us and want this special relationship to survive. I think that is the key thing. Nobody is right all the time. Nobody. And these decisions are flying at you 90 miles a minute in a highly contentious atmosphere. We just need for people to know that we wish them well and that when we bring our power to bear together, we do it because we think that the world and the next generation of children will be better off. And I think as long as we do that, this special relationship will be relevant for at least 50 more years and for all I know beyond. I think this will be the last question, r running, out of, um, running out of time. W when you all uh, speak to each other and uh, look at the world, is there one trend or one single um, uh, aspect of what's happening now across the world that, that you look at as the most important, either uh, for good or for ill? I think there are probably two for me. Um, and one of the things that's a little shocking, actually, uh, I find this particularly out in the Middle East now, is how much more I understand about it than I did when I was um, in office as prime minister. And I think one major trend is this issue to do with extremism and how we handle it. Um, because it's based on a perversion of the, of the peaceful and proper religion of Islam, but it's there and it's powerful, and it's not, I'm afraid, going away. And I think that it is not simply the actions of the extremists that are important, but there is a narrative uh, that they have developed that is a reach that, in my view, is too broad. And this issue um, that I dealt with when in office, that President Obama is having to deal with now, um, I think is, I'm afraid, is going to be with us for some time. And I think what I understand now is that the roots of it are very deep. There are genuine, powerful, religious, and cultural forces at work. And one of the reasons that I started a foundation after I left office about religious interfaith is because I, I genuinely believe that the 21st century is unlikely to be a century of, of um, fundamentalist political ideology, but it could become a century of conflict of religious or cultural ideology. And I think bringing people together in an era of globalization, respecting difference, is a, a vital part of today's world. And that is one trend that I notice that is there and needs to be countered. The second is the shift of power to the East. You know, every time I go to China or to India, I'm just amazed by what is happening. And I think for us, um, America and Europe, for centuries we've been the dominant powers. And to get in our own minds clear the sense of partnership that is now going to be necessary because we will no longer be dominant in the same way is very, very important. But as I said a moment or two ago, strangely, what it means to me is not that our relationship, America and Europe, is less important, but it's actually more important because in that emerging world, we need to have the power to be able to shape it or at least be partners on equal terms with countries that can far exceed ours in population. As I often say to people, if you just think about China today, growing in population terms every year by roughly the same amount as the UK, it's, you, know, you start, you know, China will build more power stations in the next 10 years than the whole of Europe's built since the Second World War. You, know, you get a sense of the, the sheer scale of what's happening. So those are the two trends that, that, that I um, identify. And if I had any other thought, it would be about, you know, and I write this in the book, actually, that one of the things that's interesting to me is, you know, some people in our country, at least, they talk about the younger generation and, you know, do they care in the same way and so on and so forth. They're not as idealistic as we were in the 60s and 70s. I actually have enormous faith in young people today. I think they're absolutely brilliant. Some of the young people I've got working for me in Africa and the Faith Foundation are absolutely superb. 
I'd like to finish just by saying one other lesson that the President uh, Clinton taught me. And it actually was a very important lesson of international diplomacy. And whether you remember a summit that we went to in a far off country. And one of the things that sometimes happens at these global summits is that they like you to dress for the evening dinner in their traditional costumes, right? And we were in this place. And I remember going to my room, and I was kind of new, Prime Minister wasn't quite sure how to handle it. Anyway, we had to wear a shirt, which was one of the traditional shirts of this particular place. And there were three shirts on the bed. And the first one was absolutely hideous. And the next two were worse with the third being the most hideous. Right, so I choose the bad one, but not as bad as the rest, and I put it on. I go along to the dinner, the first person I see is President Clinton there, and he's got the third, he's got the worst on. <laughs> so I, I go over to him and I say, Bill, that shirt is it's terrible. <laughs> and he says, yep. I say, Why have you got it on? He says, well, let me tell you something. You see, when I'm wearing this shirt, and my f folks back home see me on television, they'll think, there's that nice Mr. President having to be good to all those strange foreign people. He said, but when they see your folk back home see you in that shirt, they may just think you chose it. Well, I think the most important thing, I agree with Tony about the rise of the East, and, and, uh, and I agree with him about the younger generation. I think it's the most amazing group of young people, and there is a global community, thanks to the internet, of younger people who share common interests and common knowledge in ways that would have been unthinkable. Ten-year-olds can now find out and absorb and process information that you used to have to spend two years in college to get a hold of. But I think the most important thing today is the struggle unresolved between the positive and the negative forces of our global interdependence. And the fact that no one has the monopoly on power, influence, or information they once had. The Chinese state is too strong to suit most of us. And the Russians sometimes suppress non-governmental organizations do things we don't like, but nobody controls it all. Witness the tweeters in the Iranian election who, you know, made us all feel what we did. Uh, but there's a story today in the paper that's truly gripping, and I wish every American would think about it, about the incredible role the United States is playing in helping the narco-traffickers and their violent gangs in Mexico in their attempt to destroy the Mexican state and take over northern Mexico. Because we insisted, I believe wrongly, on repealing the assault weapons ban. And now all these gun stores there are selling to cutouts, people they know good and well are cutouts, 50 caliber weapons and assault weapons so that the narco traffickers are better armed than the Mexican army and the Mexican police and they're mowing them down. And keep in mind, those people are up there dying trying to keep cocaine out of the bodies of America's children. That also is interdependence. So there are all these positive and negative forces, and they're constantly at war everywhere, hard to organize, hard to direct, almost impossible to control, and hard to calculate what the long-term pluses and minuses are of making a, a sacrifice today, or do you sacrifice today, or try to manage and kick the can down the road? kind of decision he had to make a few years ago. I think those are the great questions of the 21st century. There's too much inequality in the world, but there are more people moving out of poverty than ever before. It's just that the population is growing fastest in the poorest places of the world. There's too much instability in the world, but there's also more opportunity than ever before. I think climate change is real, yet I don't think we'll deal with it until everyone's convinced it's good economics to do so. So you have all these tensions going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And 
I think if all of you are confused by some of the things you read in the paper every day, this is a nice little filter for you. You say, does, is this a manifestation of the positive or negative forces of our interdependence? That is, we can't get away from each other. What happens here affects what happens there and vice versa. And the whole, every citizen's duty is to try to build up the positive and reduce the negative forces. And when you're all said and done, the best you can ever hope for is to have a positive record because everybody makes mistakes. I think when you read Tony Blair's book, you will consider, you will conclude that he's had quite a good run and the score is very high on the positive side. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank you. I hope everyone remembers uh, the former Prime Minister has signed a copy of a book just for you, which you can collect on your way out. <laughs>